Sacrilege on Holy Week. I'm Jessica Denson, and this is Lights On. Who the hell does Donald Trump think he is? A man who routinely violates the Ten Commandments, the Bill of Rights, and threatens to terminate the Constitution is selling a book that contains all three. Selling a Bible for $59.99, a book you can get for free in any church I've ever been to, a book that warns repeatedly of false prophets, of spiritual wickedness in high places, of money changers like him turning the house of God into a den of thieves. This nation was rightly founded on a separation of church and state because men have no business legislating spiritual affairs. One's worship or lack thereof is their own business and their own salvation. Mixing religion with politics is a recipe for corruption that our founders, for all their flaws, knew well. Both the spiritual is lost and the human is poisoned with abuse of power that bears no resemblance to true faith. And that is exactly what has happened to the idolatrous movement otherwise known as Trump Republicans. They are seekers after worldly power, not after God or the poor dupes that fall for them. My guest today is all about setting the record straight on Christianity and its role in our world, particularly in our country in this moment. She was a an official in the Trump administration as the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention at the Department of Homeland Security. She very bravely spoke out before the 2020 election and her new book, Kingdom of Rage, The Rise of Christian Extremism and the Path Back to Peace is coming out this April. We got an exclusive scoop on it and I'm so excited to welcome to the show and speak to Elizabeth Newman. Elizabeth, welcome to Lights On. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It's really an honor to be with you. And um, it's such an important topic that we, uh, unfortunately, continues to be timely. It is so, so important. I think it touches to so many people's lives. Um, It's obviously in the news just this week with this, um, you know, obscene hawking of the Bible. But before we get into all that, I just want to refresh our viewers on who you are. I, of course, (laughs) got to know you um, back in 2020 because we both kind of came out around the same time with ads endorsing Joe Biden um, with Republican voters against Trump. Um, But just refresh our viewers on your experience at DHS when you left and kind of made the decision to speak out against Trump. Yeah, I left in April 2020, so COVID had set in. Um, it was kind of this weird, drawn-out uh, departure. I was in the, I was being pushed out, um, but then I was not allowed to leave until they had a replacement, and so it just kind of was this weird um, final four months. And by the time I'm departing, COVID had set in, and I just was exhausted. So I kind of shut the world out, focused on the kids. They were now home and I was having to figure out virtual learning and did we have enough toilet paper? And um, I just spent a lot of time uh, decompressing for a few months and I kind of started to re-engage with the rest of the world. And around June, when we had the uh, George Floyd's murder, uh, a series of protests, which Trump started to weaponize against um, I, I had this moment where I was like, wait, wh- how is everybody still so deceived by him? I thought it was so transparent uh, to the outside world how dangerous he was. Um, and then I was, I was struggling with trying to, to, to understand like how, how did everybody miss it? And that, so I spent time talking to family, I spent time talking to friends, and just realized that um, maybe one of the downsides to the um, good people that came into the administration trying to do the right thing, um, you know, trying to steer Trump in the right direction, keep him legal and constitutional, one of the downsides to that was that the American public really didn't understand how dangerous he was. And I kind of came to this realization that I needed to say something. I didn't think many people would listen. Um, Other people had tried to warn and and, uh, hadn't made um, much of a dent in the MAGA movement, but uh, it still felt like it was a a burden, a call to explain to the 
American public what I had witnessed inside and why I felt like he was very dangerous, um, not just from a national security standpoint, but that is definitely one of my big, biggest concerns, but um, he's dangerous to the social fabric for our country. Um, and that's, um, you know, unfortunately a, a threat that still persists today. It really does, doesn't it? I don't know if you or I could have imagined that um, four years later we would be dealing with this man as a candidate again. But I want to touch on a few of the things you mentioned. You mentioned, and I read about this in the introduction to your book, about you kind of being pushed out of the Trump administration and kind of being subject, subjected to this loyalty test when, when Johnny McEntee, um, who I unfortunately know quite well too, was brought in to head um, presidential um, personnel in the waning um, months of Trump's administration. Can you can you explain that? Yeah. So there was this moment where um, I was being pushed out of one role because, um, well, because Stephen Miller didn't like the way I had handled um, trying to implement the constitutional version of the travel ban, and um, and so I wasn't told I have to leave. I was just told you can't do this job anymore, um, which given how other people had been treated over the previous three years was kind of, you know, the writing's on the wall. You're like, yeah, it's fine. I've done as much as I can. I've held the line where I can. It's time to get out. Um, but then I was in this limbo where they were like, oh, you can't leave until you have this uh, replacement filled in for you. Um, and in the interim, I was trying to figure out a way just to gracefully exit, right? You're trying to figure out how do I uh, find the next job, and can I go over to CISA, um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and that's where Chris Krebs was. They were working on election security. Um, I knew I could probably do some some good over there working with Chris, um, and so I was actually in the process of doing that. The, the last day, I was briefing out with my staff, transitioning a new person into the role, and Friday at 6 p.m., I get a phone call that says, sorry, you can't move over to CISA, and you're like, okay, well, what's going on? And we had found out that Johnny McEntee had uh, put a halt on all personnel actions um, while he was trying to wrestle control back, um, I, I suppose from what he perceived to be a, a personnel process that was not sufficiently ensuring that the appointees were loyal to Trump. Um, and the word kind of came down that everybody in that was going to move to a new role had to go through an interview process again. Um, and then subsequently, I, at that point, I was, I didn't really want to stay, right? <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. I'm just of leaving. course. Um, All right. But there was this uh, thing that I, I would say about four to six weeks after I left, I started hearing from colleagues who were being dragged in kind of unceremoniously, like they didn't know why they were being called to a meeting. And then they were having to go through an interview process. These were people that had started uh, in 2017. They were significantly credentialed individuals, like they were highly qualified for the roles that they're playing. And so they're not being interviewed to test, like, are we really sure that you're qualified for this job? Mm -hmm. It was very much um, what the questions were like, what is your favorite uh, campaign slogan? Um, for or a campaign principle for for uh, Donald Trump, um, you know, it, 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 a few of the questions like borderline got to the to the question of if you were asked to do something illegal, would you do it? Um, it wasn't that blatant, but it was. You, you, after a while, you start to learn this crew. They offer, operate like a mafia boss. They never come right out and say the illegal thing, but they get really close, and you're like. I, I think what you're asking me to do is illegal. Um, and, and so you just, after a while, you were like, oh my gosh, like they're doing this before an election, meaning one, they don't care if this gets out. And two, they actually think that they're going to win because what they're, they were doing was setting up the second term, like weeding through who do I need to fire so that I can have sufficiently loyal people in the second term. And, you know, this week there was news reports that they're doing loyalty tests over at the RNC and you're like, oh yeah, they're, that's, that's just how they do it. It does not matter if you're credentialed. It doesn't matter if you're skilled at your job. What matters is that you will do anything to uh, serve Trump, including illegal things, including unconstitutional things. Um, and and I I don't know um, 
I, I appreciate that there are probably some people in uh, in his supporters who actually love that part about him. They they probably love that he is uh, doesn't care about following the rules. I I feel like the average Republican though doesn't know this part of the story that they think it's all made up or they think, um, you know, it's just the liberal deep state that's like hyperbolizing things. And you're like, no, like many of us went in and just assumed like, oh, it can't be that bad. I mean, I'm from Texas. I wasn't from New York. I didn't appreciate the mafia nature of how they operate. Um, but even, I mean, your story, Jessica, gives gives like the the perfect examples of how they were coming after you viciously, right? Like totally out of um, alignment or out of um, parody for the, the circumstances. What I have said, exactly. But that's yes. what they do. It's like they come at you with full force. Yes. They threaten. When I spoke out, uh, yes. we, we received threats. Um, we, friends that had access to me were threatened, um, mm -hmm. hoping that by threatening them, they could get me to be quiet. I mean, that's how they operate. They operate stealthily. It's under the radar, um, but it's it is a mafia. It is authoritarian, and there's no place for that in our government. Like that is not what we want in this country. Yeah, you're kind of leaving me speechless here a little bit, Elizabeth, because as as you're talking, I'm I'm remembering the experience I had. We also, I, I told you I was trying to get through your book, which was wonderful, by the way, in conjunction with this week, we filed in my human rights lawsuit, which is still ongoing, the one that was thwarted for years by their NDA retaliation. They're trying to silence me. And we just filed literally today um, our case, essentially, for, for the sex discrimination and all of these heinous attacks that were leveled against me by a man who, um, like Johnny McEntee, was brought in at the 11th hour because he was a loyalist and willing to do anything for Trump. Um, it really is. It really is so frightening. And like you said, um, Elizabeth, I don't think that most Republicans, mainstream Republicans, to the extent that <laughs> mainstream exists in the Republican Party, or diehard Trump supporters understand that there, a time is going to come when this formula will turn on them. Yes. It's not going to turn on the liberals. It's not going to turn on the, you know, quote unquote, Hollywood elite or whatever these fantasy, scary, evil forces are out there. It's going to turn on them. It's so true. Um, he doesn't care about them, right? Like he cares about himself. Um, and, and I, if, if there is a character trait that's stable in him, it is that if you are loyal to him, he is loyal to you. Um, but that loyalty is, it requires you to go to prison for him, right? It requires you to um, uh, break all sense of your morals and values. Like you, you uh, are then subservient to his sense of what right and wrong is. And, and I, haven't found too many examples of what wrong is other than being disloyal to him. So um, there, there is no loyalty in return other than if you have <laughs> completely, you know, given up everything about yourself, right? So right. that's the, that's the piece that you know whether you could pick up the pro life issue, like everybody thinks, like well, what, oh, because you're, what you're describing, Elizabeth, is essentially a violation of the first commandment of the Judeo-Christian theology. Oh, yeah which is yes. thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because what they have done, if you are completely subservient to the desires and whims of a man who is not God, you are inherently violating the first commandment. And that's what every single one of, you know, his followers are doing by buying into these lies and this this just blasphemy, this sacrilege, like I described it, and the people who work for him to the extent that they have any faith at all. I mean, I think a lot of them are, you know, don't even have a pretense of faith. These so-called loyalists, they're they're uh, pretty godless individuals in my in my opinion. And Jessica, that's such an excellent parallel. Like you're absolutely right. The the idea that we would um, only that our only test, our only sense of morals and right and wrong is whatever a man tells us it is. Um, that is idolatry. Um, that is, uh, you know, a blatant violation of the way of Jesus that was laid out for us in, um, in Jesus's life and teachings. 
and uh, the the uh, the fact that we have so many people either um, yeah the people around him you're absolutely right all right I most of them are are um, viewing this in a transactional way right like I'm getting something out of this my proximity to power gives me power or gives me money there's a ton of grift in the people that are surround him uh, they're making tons of money off of him and his brand um, so it it's not necessarily that same of a, a set of problems for the people that are closest to him that actually know, you know, what a flawed individual he is and the problems that he has and just doing the basics of leading anything, uh, his business or um, uh, a small organization, let alone the presidency, right? He is an incredibly flawed individual. He is not competent to do the job. Um, but that they they kind of brush that aside because they get something out of it um, and they're gaining power or money and that's very powerful. I can't understand understand that. Like that is kind of one of the oldest stories in the books. It's really hard to understand the Christian community being so complicit in um, not just holding holding your nose and voting. And I appreciate there are many many people of goodwill who did that in 2016 and did that in 2020. I feel like the 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 runway is running out for that excuse anymore. Like, hold your nose and vote for a man that refused to give up power. Hold your nose and vote for a man who summoned a mob, rallied this mob, and um, led to people's injury and death. Like, that, that is who you would be voting for. Um, that that becomes really hard for me to wrap my mind around. I, I I much like you, I try to lead with empathy. So I I do try to understand that the reason people are driven to this need to feel like they've got to vote for Trump because he's the only one that's going to protect them. You know, it's coming from a, a bunch of lies, a bunch of um, mistruths that they've been fed their entire life about how uh, their Christian faith is under attack and how. Uh, liberals are tr are trying to ruin their schools and ruin their children's futures, and um, and it's coming from a place of fear. But that's the very thing our scriptures speak to. It speaks to how do you live in a society that is antagonistic to Christian beliefs? Um, how do you live in a in a world where the earthly powers are not good? Um, and I would argue that in America, the earthly powers are you know, some of the best that we've had in the last 2000 years since Christ was on the earth. So in terms of the protections that they afford people of, of different faiths. So it's just, it's kind of this confounding um, moment that we're in where the believers are, are, have been fed lies and they're not, even if those lies, even let's suspend the fact that I think most of the things that they're being fed to fear are not based in truth. Let's say you just genuinely are fearful. Well, our scriptures have answers to that. And the answer is not to put your hope in man. In fact, there's tons of scriptures that say, do not put your trust in men or in military might uh, or in money. It says, put your trust in God. Mm -hmm. And that that the, commu the Christian community has just abandoned that call. And I'm not saying it's an easy call. It is hard to trust God day in and day out. But we should be rallying each other to pursue that um, that effort to trust the Lord day in and day out instead of giving into our fears and thinking that we have to vote for this immoral, godless um, idol of a man. You know, Elizabeth, I think it is vitally important as Christians, and I always, you know, that's why I do this on my show. I bring up these topics not to proselytize. You know, we're not here. To, I'm not here to convert anybody, but I am here to set the record straight on what real Christianity is. I mean, this has been the savior of my life. I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have had the victories without it. And I love that your book, um, you are not shy about this. You you touch on this Um you know, this is the theme throughout of your book is is correcting the record on Christianity. And as you were speaking, I, I thought of a phrase that I used to use a lot and haven't recently, but it's up is down. You know, in the Trump universe, in the in the Fox News propaganda world, um, everything is inverted. You know that you say, you know, Christians are holding their breath, but it's it's beyond that. I mean, they are just flatly voting against their 
their interests if they understood who represents what in this scenario. Um, I, I want to play in a second the clip, um, uh, talk about holding, holding our breath, uh, just a clip of Trump's hawking of the Bible and get your reaction. But um, I just want to remind our viewers, we are live live today as we've been doing with our live guests. Elizabeth has been very generous. She's offered to take your live questions at the end. So definitely stick around um, and we will take some, some questions from the audience before we end the show today. But um, let me just play, I couldn't, I couldn't stomach playing too much of it, but I'm going to play just a clip of this um, Bible sale <clears throat> from the also, Orange. Also, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this. God bless the USA Bible, and it's just very important and very important to me. I want to have a lot of people have it. You have to have it for your heart, for your soul. Many of you have never read them and don't know the liberties and rights you have as Americans and how you are being threatened to lose those rights. It's happening all the time. It's a very sad thing that's going on in our country, but we're going to get it turned around. Religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country, and I truly believe that we need to bring them back, and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many it's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. I, I wonder. I just wonder what he is using those Bibles for. Is he like standing on them? Is he like have them under furniture to like prop it up? I mean, clearly maybe, not. They're not being opened. <laughs> I was going to say maybe if you, he should try reading them. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> No, I, I have to, it's, I, it's funny, I have two reactions. One is my stomach turns, like it yeah. actually is, that is so blasphemous that like from the, from a uh, believer standpoint, like it's it's really hard to watch that. And then there's the, the other side that you're like, I, this is such, these are such lies. How does anybody I know. fall for it? But they they do, I mean, clearly it works. They They, they sell Bibles and, make money off of it. Um, just, but it, yeah, it back to, it, it turns my stomach. It's just kind of sad. Definitely did. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the first impeachment when he would go out there on the, on the stump and say, read the transcript, read the transcript. And then you'd ask the supporters, you'd say, so did you read the transcript? They're like, no. <laughs> of course, if you actually read the transcript, he was guilty as hell. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, now he is, look, he is a master at entertainment and at staging um one of my first memories back in 2017 we were at dhs secretary kelly is the secretary at the time um and we had some sort of event that he was going to go to i can't remember what the event was but uh i i i was staffing him i was the deputy chief of staff at the time and we have our advanced guy in and we're we're doing some prep and then we're going to the president calls in and and i don't know if that part was planned or not but the president ends up on the phone um and we're briefing him on this event and i've done this before i worked in the bush administration um i've worked for cabinet secretaries before usually when you're briefing somebody on an event you're briefing them on who is there what the key message is what we're trying to accomplish um what his speech or his remarks will be about and so i'm i'm assuming that that's what we're going into and then all of a sudden the uh, Trump stops and, and starts asking questions about um, the size of the stage and how long, how big is the flag in the backdrop and what about where the cameras are going to be? I mean, it was all about the the look the of visuals. the, event, the yeah. visuals. And it was my first moment of going like, oh, so we don't we don't we don't actually do the presidential stuff. He just goes and plays the president. He, he just wants to like be on stage and get the accolades. He doesn't actually want to do the work. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I too was naive. Um, uh, I, not that I ever thought that he was going to be a great president. I just naively assumed, oh, we can't be that bad because everybody like has some sort of human decency and they're going to get into the Oval Office and they're going to realize like, oh, no, this is serious. I, sh I should really try my best here. I should get some really smart people around me and, and I should do well in this role. 
um because this is important i just i just assumed that that's how we all felt as americans no it is i mean i i I say there was uh, in 2016 like speaking of performance there was one particular piece of bs that i really fell for which not a lot of people remember but trump would go out there and he would say with all his madness and his rallies and everything in 2016 he would say uh, when I become president, I'm going to be so presidential. They're going to be so bored. <laughs> and, you know, I li- I heard what I wanted to hear. So when he said things like that, I'm like, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear that he's going to be a boring president and this whole campaign shtick is going to end. And he's, you know, because he's such an excellent businessman, this nonsense, ignorant, uneducated um, mindset of mine about who Trump was. You know, I really thought that he was an effective and successful businessman. And uh, <laughs> that's what our country yeah. needed. <laughs> Uh, the ignorant, my ignorance was quite vast in, in 2015, 2016, Elizabeth. Coming from, by the way, someone who graduated at the top of my class with two majors in three years. I mean, I am not a stupid person. This this propaganda sucks in the best of us. And, you know, I, I think it does. And I think it it's a um, I do think that that's part of why the Christian community might be more susceptible because we are taught to offer people grace, to assume the best of other people. Um, and and I had this moment sometime probably in the 2018 uh, time frame where I was like, I need to stop making excuses. Like I, this is, this is, I've moved out of I'm offering grace to I'm making excuses. Like there is a point at which you need to be held accountable for your actions. Uh, for what you say and what you do. You should be held accountable uh, for understanding the impact that your words have on other people. Um, And in particular, I was uh, working on the domestic terrorism portfolio at the time. And so we were starting to see that he would say things and then hate crimes would increase or an attack occurs in 2019 using his campaign language um, in in a, a terrorist manifesto. Like at some point, you do own that. You are accountable for that. I'm not saying it's the same as pulling the trigger, but um, I I had to come to the conclusion, um, and maybe it was too late, uh, later than I I should have, but it also was kind of drilled into me that, um, you know, being a Christ follower does mean that you offer people the benefit of the doubt, and you don't assume the worst of them. And, And so I think that made us susceptible to some of that propaganda uh, but again, I keep coming back to it's 2024 now. <laughs> We've seen it. We've seen the fruits of his work. And, yeah. and I don't know that we can, as believers, I, I just think that the runways run out on the argument that you can hold your nose and vote for him. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying you got to vote for Biden. You can vote your conscience in terms of write somebody in. But I, I don't think that you can vote for somebody um, who has demonstrated time and time again a lack of respect for fellow human beings, um, has led to people dying because of his words and actions, and and quite frankly, just can't do the job. Like, he's not competent to do the job. He was derelict in his duty on any number of fronts. 100%. And then the person, the people behind the scenes who are competent but dangerous are the ones that are really um, running the government, and that's scary as hell. But there's two themes before we go to break, Elizabeth, that you put uh, that you were mentioning there that I want to pick up on. The grace aspect is huge because I I agree with that. You know, I thought, oh, we can back in 2016, we can forgive all Trump's sins. And I just saw him as this like grandfather figure who had moved on from maybe the worst parts of his life that I even knew about. A lot of them I was totally blind to. But that grace on the part of Republicans does not exist for Democrats who, by the way, are being slandered 24-7 on right-wing cable news, violating the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor all day long. And, you know, we the, the, the MAGA masses are taught to have absolutely no grace for them, but yet have grace and forgiveness for a man who does not even abide by the tenets of Christianity by repenting for his sins and reforming. I mean, this is like <laughs> the key to salvation that they, they want to take out of the equation. When Donald Trump forgave the adulterer, when Donald Trump, oh my God, when Jesus Christ forgave the adulterous woman, he said, go and sin no more. 
He didn't mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, by the way, go and just uh, sleep with the next man you see. No, go and sin no more. And you've got in Donald Trump, this unrepentant sinner who won't even admit the most you know, mundane of his faults and he is full of them. And this is supposed to be a leader, somebody who represents the mantle of Christ Jesus. Yeah, it's um, so, so much of like part of the reason I wrote the book was like I, I couldn't understand. I was, it was like, how did how did this happen to the community that I grew up in? And, you know, in the 90s, like we were the the ones after Clinton saying, oh, no, he is no longer suitable. Yes. Um, morally be unfit because he, yeah, he morally unfit to be president yeah. of the United States. Um, and and I, I, you know, was trying to to rationalize or, or make sense of how a community of uh, individuals who, for the most part, um, and it, I realize we're lumping, like, MAGAverse is huge. And, and yeah. I really am, while I explored both conservatives and Christians in my book, I really was probably more focused on the, the Christian piece of it um, because I, because our, of what our faith teaches, it was harder for me to reconcile how you go from um, the teachings of turn the other cheek um, and to love your enemy um, and pray for those who persecute you to, uh, as you were just referencing, um, own the libs, beat up um, the deep state, um, and you know, talking about uh, in the, this election cycle, it's we're gonna persecute and prosecute anybody that was anti-Trump. Um, so the the idea that uh, that is, in fact, what I mean, he's he plays into that. Now, I, I think that's his style and his personality, but he plays that strongman role because it works. It the if the Christian community was repulsed by that and said, no, that is not what we want from our leader, he would probably change his tune a bit because he wants the power. Um, so he is in some ways just a mirror of what the Christian community wants. They what want they're allowing, what they're allowing, which is by, by the way, this hypocrisy, this hijacking of true faith is as old as the Bible itself. Yes. That's so so true. it's it's nothing new. Um, I w Elizabeth, we have so much more to discuss. I want to talk to you a lot more about right wing extremism, what we're facing with the potential, God forbid, Project 2025 and questions from the audience. We're just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. I've tried so many different things to maintain a heart healthy lifestyle like crash court diets or starting a daunting cardio routine. And frankly, it just hasn't been helpful for me. We often think living a more heart healthy life means making big unsustainable changes. But with Super Beats Heart Shoes, you can get daily blood pressure support in just two tasty chews a day. And they even promote heart healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Heart health is important for me because I want to be around as long as possible for my loved ones. Super Beats Heart Shoes gives me the peace of mind that I'm doing the right thing and doing something good for myself every day. I take Super Beats Heart Shoes every morning and after taking them, I feel like I have more energy to take on the day. Super Beats Heart Shoes are a convenient way to support healthy blood pressure. No pills to swallow, no ingredients to mix or prepare. It's plant-based and no artificial sweeteners or colors. I cannot recommend Super Beats Heart Shoes enough for our listeners. Double your potential with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Get a free month supply of Super Beats Heart Shoes on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to lightsonbeats.com. We've got our own website, folks. Get this exclusive offer only at lightsonbeats.com, L-I-G-H-T-S-O-N-B-E-E-T-S.com. Thank you. The older I get, the more I find myself wanting to be more intentional about the way I live, what I eat, and how I take care of my body. Mosh! is a company founded by Maria Shriver and her son Patrick Schwarzenegger with a simple mission to create conversation about brain health through food, education, and research. 
Maria's father suffered from Alzheimer's, and since then, she and Patrick have dedicated themselves to finding ways to help other families dealing with this debilitating disease. Mosh joined forces with the world's top scientists and functional nutritionists to go beyond your average protein bar with six delicious flavors. Each Mosh bar has 12 grams of protein and is made with ingredients that support brain health like ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. They also have a line of plant-based protein bars in three delicious flavors. But here's the best part to make you feel good. Mosh donates a portion of all proceeds from your order to fund gender-based brain health research through the women's Alzheimer's movement. Why gender-based? Two-thirds of all Alzheimer patients are women. Mosh is working closely to close the gap between women and men's health research. The Mosh bars are incredibly delicious. They are my favorite. My favorite is the peanut butter crunch. Now I eat my mosh bar in the morning for breakfast and it's the perfect way to kickstart my morning. I'm always carrying around my mosh bars. The mosh bars travel super well and always make for the best pre-workout meal for me. If you want to find ways to give back to others and fuel your body and your brain, mosh bars are the perfect choice for you. Head to moshlife.com slash lights to save 20% off plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack at M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash lights. Thank you, Mosh, for sponsoring this episode. So, Elizabeth, your book is really um in a beautiful way, trying to get to solutions to um, some of the scariest things that we are facing. You write in it, and I thought this was really, really beautiful. My hope for this book is that it will educate you, enlighten you, horrify you, and motivate you to be a part of the solution to the growing nightmare of extremism that exploits our faith to justify violence. Um, and of course, you draw on your work in Homeland Security, um, especially pointing out how the biggest threat that we face right now is from within. It's not foreign terrorism, it's domestic terrorism. Um, can you talk about just the evidence that you saw when you were at DHS of right-wing extremism and how prevalent it is today? Yes, I, you know, it, for those of us that went into counterterrorism post 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, the, it was a bit of a, um, it took us a while um, too long to see the domestic terrorism problem that we had. Um, so many of us uh, joined up in the fight, um, had not been working in the space in the 1990s when we had the last big wave of uh, domestic terrorism um, in the United States, uh, Oklahoma City bombing being like the, the pinnacle of that movement, but there were many other uh, smaller incidents um, with militia, with white supremacists, with um, anti-abortion extremism um, that mostly were dealt with as a law enforcement problem that the FBI handled. Um, there were uh, also some examples of things not going well, like Ruby Ridge and Waco. Um, and uh, largely 9-11 happens and the focus completely shifts and at the same time, you have um, the domestic terrorism movements kind of went a bit quiet. They didn't go away. They just went quiet. And that is not abnormal. When you have an external threat, usually people rally around that external enemy and they kind of set aside their internal grievances. Um, but around 20, uh, 2008, um, you had a couple of key factors that we now better appreciate contribute to domestic terrorism or domestic extremist movements. Um, you had a financial crisis. Um, every wave that we've seen of domestic extremism, um, it, there, it's usually precipitated by some sort of financial crisis. It creates a grievance, right? It creates a, a frustration with the situation um, that many people might be in. Um, we also were coming out of a war. Um, that is another known uh, contributor. Uh, it, it doesn't mean necessarily that the veterans were coming home and becoming extremists. It's rather more, it's a little more complex than that. It's just having um, uh, the country be uh, war, war um, weary 
and frustrated. And there was a lot of uh, frustration, particularly around the Iraq war um, and feeling that uh, it was a war we shouldn't have been in. Um, and that kind of created, created some grievance uh, as well. And then um, we also had the election of our first black president. And I really wish when I did this research, I really wish it was just the first two. Um, I wish it was just uh, the financial crisis and um, a, a period of uh, war um, that led to the spike in extremism. But there really is, uh, the evidence was pretty clear that uh, having a first black president created um, either opportunities for extremists to exploit um, unwitting people who, um, and when I say unwitting, I, I think um, I think it's fair to say that um, certainly older generations uh, lose some of their biases um, uh, more, and, and it's more difficult for them to let go of perhaps what they grew up with. Um, so there are no doubt winning racists in our country still today, and there were definitely present in 2008. Um, but what you saw occur is that um, various systems and structures found dog whistling ways um, to make uh, the fact that we had our first black president an issue. Um, and uh, probably the, the best example of that is the birth certificate argument um, or using his middle name um, very prominently kind of implying that uh, he was actually um, that, that President Obama was actually Muslim um, and implying that we should be fearful of having a Muslim as a president because, uh, you know, we had we were about eight or nine years um, post 9-11. So there was like there were a, a number of factors that various actors tried to exploit um, and those grievance structures kind of set in and it kind of resurged uh, the extremist movement. Um, in particular, we saw increases in militia, militia uh, membership, and um, we didn't see a, a spike in attacks until the mid-2010s, um, but by uh, 2015, if you look at charts showing um, the number of attacks and plots uh, going back to 1994, um, you can look at starting at 2015, we start to see a pretty dramatic shift upwards. And um, the other piece that we didn't quite appreciate because when you have a trend starting, you can't really see the trend until several years of data come in. So it was probably 2018, 2019, where we're like, the threat has morphed and changed. And it has changed in the way that, for example, ISIS attacks. Um, and the, 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 there was a shift from an Al-Qaeda model of complex coordinated attacks and ISIS um, being much more like hey, you don't need to come and get trained by us. Just grab whatever weapon you can get your hands on and go create um, chaos. Go use a car, use a knife, use a, a gun and kill as many people as possible in our name. And you're doing jihad and, and we'll get credit for it, right? So there's, there's this massive shift in what uh, foreign terrorism was doing. But at the same time, we started to pay attention to this domestic terrorism movement and when you start to look at the data, you realize actually the attacks and plots coming from domestic terrorists has stayed higher than anything ISIS or Al Qaeda did, um, with the exception of 9/11. And there's a there's a bit of a reckoning for the community. Um, now, granted, the counterterrorism community and the executive branch, we're doing the job that Congress told us to do, right? Congress passes the law, they give the budget, and we're all told go make sure Al-Qaeda can't hit us ever again. Um, go protect our infrastructure so that it's a harder target. And, that, and we did that. Um, but we should have seen, we should have seen that we had actually more attacks and plots coming from Americans or from people that were residing in the United States than we did from ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And that, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't still try to protect from ISIS and Al Qaeda affiliates who still would love to cause us harm. Like that's still a threat in the homeland. But today, the most lethal and prevalent threat comes from domestic extremists and, and in particular extremists which academics 
label as right-wing violent extremists. Now, the government doesn't use that term, but academics use that term. And specifically, white supremacist extremists and anti-government extremists. Those are the most likely to lead to mass death compared to any other form of domestic extremism, including the far left, uh, which tends to focus more on um, disruption to services or uh, property damage. Uh, they tend to not do attacks with the purpose of killing. Um, so those are the, the threat vectors that we're facing today. Um, the challenge that we have in trying to educate Americans on that is that it became so politicized uh, during the Trump administration. Um, and it, it's part of the reason it made my job hard um, when I was responsible for counterterrorism at the Department of Homeland Security. We, we were grappling with what was happening, trying to understand the trends. And what normally would happen is a president would turn to his cabinet secretaries, sign an executive order and say, go figure this out, go figure out what's happening why we're seeing, um, you know, a, a mass attack in El Paso uh, on a, a synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, what happened in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, um, using very similar themes is what we saw show up um, in El Paso. You know, go go figure this out. Usually the president doesn't come up with the solutions. He just tells his people, go look at this and then come tell me what we should do. And we had the opposite happen. We had a president who could not call it domestic terrorism. Um, I was, had a meeting in the White House shortly after the El Paso attack and was told um, that we, we were trying to, to get some funds for the Department of Homeland Security to, to do more on domestic terrorism. And the people I was working with thankfully totally understood and agreed with our approach. And they not so subtly said, so when we brief the president, we're going to talk about this in terms of violence prevention. Mm -hmm. And I responded with, hey, I, I understand and I appreciate that you are going to navigate what you need to in order to get to the yes. I am going to, and I know my boss, who at the time was Secretary McElhinney, we're going to call this what it is. It is domestic terrorism. And we're not going to mince words about that we have a domestic terrorism problem. Um, and that's just, it's a small thing, but it's just kind of the example of where you are dealing with incompetence and somebody who's derelict in duty. Your job as president is to keep Americans safe. Like that's kind of, that's really it. There's a lot of other interesting things you can do, but constitutionally, the main reason we have a federal government is to provide for the national defense. You're supposed to keep us safe. And he absolutely refused to acknowledge that we even had a problem. It is so scary. And you know, I'm, I'm just, as you're talking, I'm thinking about censorship within government. These are people that rail against censorship from without when you, not only are they censoring people, you know, citizens, I was a public, a very, you know, notable example of this, but they're censoring their own administration. Like they can't even have honest conversations behind closed doors because they might offend somebody's ego. That is extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, and I know you wrote a lot, a lot about this in your book. You've got the very real threat of this right-wing extremism um, that is often, as you describe, having this unholy alliance with Christianity. And where I think you and I would agree, agree there's no real um, Christian backing <laughs> to this, this use of force and violence. But um, on the flip side, they are constantly trying to demonize those far left extremist causes, which, which as you mentioned, are much less violent in nature. Um, and you know, I, I think back to those years when I was an avid Fox News viewer and they will take some minor incident, label it Antifa. Antifa is, correct me if I'm wrong, but really kind of a nebulous organization. It's not even a cogent, you know, entity, but they, they make you think that Antifa's out there just setting our whole country on fire. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, ignoring the real threats. Yes, Antifa was the great boogeyman of 2020. Um, and you're right, it started well before that. Um, there were a series of campus protests in 2016, 2017 timeframe. And um, and look, I believe that campus administrators handled the response poorly. 
They did not hold students accountable for inappropriate behavior. Um, they did not, um, uh, they, they kind of, by not doing that, led the way for cancel culture to just go out of control. And there's some really good research that's been done by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukanoff in Coddling of the American Mind. And then Greg Lukanoff just released a book um, uh, called Canceling of the American Mind. Uh, Yasha Monk has explored this problem as well from as a as a liberal progressive, like kind of saying like, hey, hey, guys, we jumped the shark here a bit. <laughs> like we're we do actually believe in, in the principles of classical liberalism that um, we don't cancel people just because they have an opinion different than ours. Um, and, and so there is something that went wrong on the left. Um, and it would be really great for those on the left who are of, you know, a, a sound principles and who are committed to democracy and classical li liberalism to address that and get that fixed. Um, because it is like, like you said, it is the candy that uh, feeds the outrage cycle on the right. So I'm, I'm not saying that, hey, the liberals are responsible for uh, conservatives not being able to, um, you know, for going off the deep end and somehow thinking that um, violence is necessary to to secure their way of life. Um, but I am saying, like, if if you actually want a path out of this, we all kind of have to own our peace. And there are certain things that happened um, in the last 10 years that the right was reacting to. So don't give them something to react to. Um, the, let's let's try to create frameworks for, for reasonable adults to try to um, interact with each other civilly. And uh, what yeah, happened- Yeah, and have the hard conversations that we really need to have to have healing. I mean, we shouldn't be yeah. afraid of them. But you yeah. know, what? one thing one thing I always try to point out to, cons you know, even um, to, to re Republicans, Trump supporters who bring up this concept of cancel culture with me, which obviously is a real thing in society, I try to make this distinction. There are organizations, maybe left leaning, like colleges, like universities, um, like you know, private or I don't want to say left leaning, but just private businesses, organizations that have fired people because of you know something, this, that, or another thing. That is not the government. That That's is a right. society issue. On the flip side, you have Republicans and Donald Trump as their dear leader using the levers of government to cancel people, to cancel right. opinions that are not popular, uh, that do not do their bidding, to in, in, enact retribution and punishment to their enemies, um, silencing critics as I was using a you know, campaign NDA illegally as a cutout for in, um, violations of people's First Amendment rights. These are the levers of government canceling, mm -hmm. silencing, and violating people's free speech rights, which is um, quite different than society doing it. Not that the societal issue is not one that we have to address, but we must understand the distinction. You are absolutely right, Jessica. And, um, you know, to close the, the loop on the Antifa piece, I think the thing that I found so disgusting about 2020 is that the moment that Donald Trump finally was willing to talk about domestic terrorism, it was uh, to, to warn that Antifa was a domestic terrorist group and that they were responsible for the protests, um, the post-George Floyd murder protests. Um, and it was, uh, it turns out, it was right-wing extremists that were responsible for the deaths of law enforcement officers during those protests. Um, it was a movement called the Boogaloo, and they believe, or their whole MO is that they're trying to create chaos and they take advantage of moments of societal discord, like a protest, um, and they infiltrate and try to create more chaos by shooting a law enforcement officer, starting a fire. So they actually come in as instigators, hoping that it accelerates the collapse of society. They hold this ideology that society someday is going to collapse. Uh, we're going to have some sort of massive civil war and it's all going to get burned down to the ground. Um, and then we can build something better, newer. And they often hold different views about what the better, newer thing is. Uh, but the main 
rallying cry is let's burn it down faster. So let's accelerate that demise of society. It was the Boogaloo who had killed law enforcement officers in LA who had um, done a number of um, activities during those protests, mostly peaceful protests. Um, and he was totally redirecting and saying, oh, it's Antifa. Um, even when it became much more prominently known, like it was weeks, it wasn't like uh, months for them to realize who had killed these uh, law enforcement officers. Um, he didn't, of course, retract any of that. He, he was, this was his campaign. He had, his campaign was law and order and I got to protect you from Antifa. So much so that like a year later I was doing um, kind of a virtual event uh, with some people in Texas and somebody really seriously, like almost tears in their eyes, asked me, do you think those Antifa protesters are going to come here? Do I need to move out of the city limits of Dallas because they might burn down my community? And and I like it actually really hurt my heart um, because this individual it, it just had been watching Fox News, you know, and this is what Fox News was telling them. Uh, he He wasn't stupid. He wasn't um, you know, intentionally, you know, like angry at, uh, you know, oh, the libs in the deep state. He he just genuinely was scared for his family. And there was no reason for him to be scared for his family. I, I was grateful I could reassure him. Um, but that's that's what happened in 2020. Fox News played a couple of incidents on repeat, misappropriated it to Antifa. Now, that, that's not to say that there aren't individuals who are anti-fascist, um, there actually isn't an official organization that's called Antifa because that, um, and they tend to be anarchist in nature and anarchists don't like organizations. So they tend to not be very well organized. Um, so so let's you not up, let the facts get in the way of our narrative, right? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're very loosely affiliated. They, they do cause harm in places like mm -hmm. Portland. Portland has a local problem. Um, there are places in the, you know, we saw the Seattle um, uh, Capitol Hill um, autonomous zone, uh, you know, that I'm not saying that there aren't locally driven problems caused by individuals, but it's not this massive organized movement to try to like take over the entirety of the United States and burn it all down. Um, if there is an, a national movement to burn it all down, it's coming from the right, uh, from malicious white supremacist Boogaloo who um, want a civil war so that they can either get their white nation back or restore what they believe um, the constitutionally correct form of government is. Um, so like the, the, it's fascinating to me to watch how people get misdirected um, and I, it's clearly deliberate, um, but they, they go and look in fear at this other, the other side, the other party is the one that is gonna actually caused so much harm to my family. And you're like, actually, no, it's your side that is more likely to have an attack that affects your family. Um, and we really need to wake up to that because, because it's coming from our side, we actually have more power to disrupt it, more power to build protective factors in our kids so that our kids don't get radicalized and um, more power to um, get people help who need it well before they actually cross that criminal threshold. That's been one of the big changes in the counterterrorism movement over the tw last 20 years is realizing that we actually do know enough now that we can intervene and we can stop these attacks, um, but it requires effort and it requires education. And we get so wrapped around the axle, focusing on like, oh, it's Antifa or, oh, you just are painting all of us as terrorists. And, you know, you, and, and you're like, no, like the, the heart here is actually, I want my kids to have their kids not have to worry about the next school shooting. Like my kids aren't going to get that, but maybe for my grandkids, we could stop this epidemic. And I want my kids to not have to warn their children when they're walking into the Walmart. Um, you have to listen to mommy's voice. If I tell you drop, you drop. If I tell you run, you run. We don't have to live this way anymore. But until we acknowledge this problem that we have and how we got here, we're not going to be able to find a way out. Amen, Elizabeth. Um, it's really unthinkable, the things that we're living through. And when you're talking about these forces that sow division and fear, 
um, literally perpetuating the problems that they claim to have solutions to while offering no real solutions to them. Um, I really see this as the antichrist to bring our conversation full circle. Um, one of our, I, we're definitely, we're gonna go into overtime for a minute. So if you guys wanna type in your questions, I, I didn't forget about you. We're definitely gonna bring in some questions for Elizabeth. But one of our viewers um, referenced referenced a passage from Romans that I just thought was was very relevant to this because you're talking about helping people out of this miasma, this mental miasma, this hypnotism and blasphemy. And this is a passage from Romans for, for any Christians out there. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Pretty much says it all, doesn't it? It does, and, and it brings to mind there are other passages that Paul wrote a warning that there would be false prophets, warning that um, we, we had to be on our guard against um, uh, being persuaded towards like just very normal human things like we crave money we crave power we crave sex we right and like we normally um you know back in the 1980s more majority politics like oh it's the outside world that we have to protect against and you know the enemy was you know um cr you know could creep in and corrupt our church and and i think in being so ex externally focused <laughs> We missed, you know, the enemy within our own heart, right? Like we're all sinners. We all, um, uh, if we're not um, careful um, and don't have, uh, you know, not working with the Lord or and working in a in a healthy church community, um, it can be easy to deceive ourselves, and um, and that's unfortunately what has happened to a large portion of our community is they're they're in this echo chamber of deception that seems to have missed that they're following a false prophet. All right, I'm gonna bring in one of the first questions uh, from the chat. Um, have you ever had the chance to talk to Franklin Graham? Not personally, no. Um, have you, Jessica? That's so interesting. <laughs> okay. No. Um, <laughs> you know, fortunately, I, 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 talk to, I talk to God as much as possible and as little to other men about religion. <laughs> Um, Other than just with wonderful people like you to correct the record. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I have, I have some friends who are, uh, shall we say, like at one point were in fellowships, too strong of a word. You know, they ran in similar circles. Um, and I, my impression is that, um, you know, sadly, I think with many senior, uh, senior is the wrong word, uh, leaders in the Christian movement that kind of jumped on the Trump bandwagon. Um, I, I think that there is evidence, I'm not saying this specifically about Franklin Graham, I'm saying this more broadly. Yeah. Uh, there is evidence of character deficiency in how um, they treat people and how they um, uh, lead their organizations. Sure. And why does that matter? Um, it, I kind of feel like if you were not, like we're all human, I yell at my kids when I haven't gotten enough sleep at night and they've <laughs> you know, done, not done the thing I've asked them to do for the gazillionth time. I'm not asking for our leaders to be perfect. I am asking for there to be a repentant uh, spirit, as you mentioned before, Jessica, right. when we don't meet the mark and that, we treat whether it's our family members or the people that we're in organizations with um, the church uh, the people you lead there there should be an effort to try to treat those people the way jesus treated his disciples and his loved ones um and i my my sense is that um many we have many leaders in the church uh, in positions of power that are very authoritarian and not marked by the way of Christ. And I, I think if we had done a better job um, requiring leaders of Christian organizations to actually demonstrate the character of Christ, 
we wouldn't have the political problem that we do, right? Like there's, there's a, it's, it's tied. If your character is deficient in the small things and leading your church or leading your family, then you're not going to be able to have the character in place to make the right decision when the president of the United States calls and wants your endorsement, right? Like that you're going to easily yeah. fail that one if you can't deal well with the small stuff. Absolutely. You're bringing to mind another passage from the Bible that led me out of the darkness that I was in, which is um, you can't pour out at this same fountain, sweet water and bitter. You know, either you have a pure stream or it's corrupt. And um, that that was, you know, that was where my faith and understanding of Christianity brought me to the light um, and guided me out of this darkness and deception that I had been um, fallen prey to. Mm -hmm. Um, on the on these lines, um, Elizabeth, somebody asked, how do you gently remind someone that they are acting contrary to, to their faith? How does that conversation happen? Uh, I think you have to be in relationship. Um, and I, you know, I, some of this is Holy Spirit led, right? If you're right. <laughs> um, sometimes Jesus was very direct with his disciples, right? Yes. And yes. told Peter, Satan, get behind me. Right. So there's Absolutely. there are moments maybe where they, Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world and every material thing, and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Yes. But then Hello. he says, he says <laughs> the same line to Peter later, right? And so, like, here he is, and clearly he loves Peter as one of his three core disciples. Um, I, on Peter, you the rock I'm going to build my church on, right? Loves Peter and has no problem admonishing him um, and correcting him when he needed to. So, so there is time and place for that. But and that's true love, isn't it? Correction is yeah. true love. It is. And, you know, but he, he didn't walk to the women in, at the well and yeah. use that same tactic. He didn't have that's a relationship. Wise. Or yet. Um, so, so relationship is really important. Um, and, and then I would, I would say I would have commit, committed to prayer. Uh, in my book, I actually talk about the importance of um, uh, taking the log out of our own eye before we yes. try to help yes. restore those in our community. Um, that doesn't have to be a, a, a super lengthy process. I, I just think that we should be prayerful before we approach somebody. And I do think that there are times when the Holy Spirit says, no, don't say anything. And there are times when the Holy Spirit says, yes, speak. Um, and there are also times when we speak and it's that passage of um, if it's rejected, okay, we've, we've done our part. And Jesus says we uh, brush the dust off of our feet and we move on. Um, so, so there's, there's plenty of good um, examples in scripture for how we approach a fellow brother or sister in Christ who um, we believe is in sin. Um, and I think you use that model, um, but but can I, two, two like highlights from the book that I just yeah. hit on yeah. over and over again. All of the evidence tells us you cannot argue somebody out of their ideology. So if somebody really believes the election was stolen um, or somebody really believes QAnon is real, um, you're probably not going to argue them out of that. So um, your approach in those circumstances is much more about maintain relationship, be empathetic. You can acknowledge the real grievances. There probably are real grievances that underpin why they've been pulled into those belief systems. Um, but don't, you're, you're also looking for opportunities to hold them accountable. So it's empathy and accountability. And usually when we see people move out of a radicalized ideology or a conspiracy theory, it's because of those two factors. There's, they've had some of their needs met um, by um, ex receiving a sense of belonging or significance from somebody or something else and an accountability for the way in which that ideology or that conspiracy theory is not serving them well. Uh, you know, Sometimes it's somebody gets fired from a job because they have a white supremacist tattoo um, it can be something like that, or it can be a family member saying, no, I, I'm sorry, you cannot be around my young children um, and and spout that ideology. So accountability, but also empathy and the um, maintaining a relationship to the extent that you are safe and your family is safe um, is always a, a wonderful way to you just never know how the Lord might work through that relationship. 
Uh, I'll definitely second that listening for divine guidance on when to speak, when not to, what to say, um, how to act. I can definitely testify to, um, you know, God putting the words in my mouth in so many instances. He most certainly did when I when I was in court by myself without a lawyer going to argue against Trump lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was all God. It was I was struggling so much at that time with finding representation and so afraid handling my legal cases literally on my own. And I I worked with this concept of representation, and I thought I'm out here desperately looking for representation, someone to represent me. And I had this angel direction that I needed to start worrying about what I was representing. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go into court. And I need to represent God. I need to represent truth. I need to represent a woman's worth. And I went in with a tiny little paper of notes. And um, you better believe that God put every one of those words into my mouth. And it turned out beautifully. I was victorious. So, um, Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth, I feel like you and I could go on for hours. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope you will come back again so we can continue this conversation. Um, yeah, but tell us tell us where we can pre-order your book, Kingdom of Rage. Um, yes, you can pre-order at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, Walmart, Target. Uh, you can also go to my website, elizabethnewman.org backslash book, and you can see all of those links. Um, and it comes out April 23rd. Love it, love it. Well, happy Easter, Elizabeth. Thank you Happy for joining Easter. me. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today, for um, participating in the live chat and giving uh, Elizabeth your questions to respond to. It's been wonderful to spend this hour with you. Um, as always, you can support this show by subscribing to Lights On with Jessica Denson wherever you get your audio podcasts. And also by subscribing to my YouTube channel, Jessica Denson, where you will always get this episode as well as special episodes we do throughout the week. We've got some special episodes coming up with Representative Eric Swalwell, as well as the um, family members of fallen Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick. I'm really looking forward to bringing those interviews to you. Um, and if you would like to support my ongoing legal battle against the Trump campaign that, as I mentioned, was uh, had a lot of work to do on this week, you can do so at thejessicadenson.com slash donate. We need your support and are so grateful for it. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, as always, I would love for you to continue to let your light shine. Mm -hmm.